ringer. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back, or welcome if this is your first Mosaic Arts on Live, Mosaic Arts Online live event here at our YouTube channel. We are so excited that we have continued this tradition since now over a year and a half of having a chance to gather together virtually and share and engage in a live way so that we can sort of still share what's going on even though we can't all physically be together. So this is such a wonderful day today to have our special guest. We'll be launching a course and we have a lot to cover from Detroit, Michigan. I would love to introduce our latest instructor to Mosaic Arts Online, Darcel Danu. And before Dar Tammy, I think we lost the connection. I'm waiting for Tammy and Darcel to know. Um, I'll be teaching perspective and mosaic. Um, <laughs> Tammy, are you back? Over here. You hear me? Okay. You blocked you you out for a while. You're, here you are. So, anyway, we want to introduce you from Detroit, Michigan. What's going on? Technical difficulties. <clears throat> okay. We're back. Are you there? I'm here. We've been on for 20 minutes just chatting and now all of a sudden it's being silly. All right, sorry everyone, here we are. So I'm just gonna introduce one more time from Detroit, Michigan, Darcel Denu. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you, Tim. Awesome, all right. So Darcel is, from, is a native of Detroit, Michigan, and she's here today to talk a little bit about her background as an artist and how she transitioned into mosaic art, which kind of came to her late in life. Many people kind of take on mosaic art as a hobby, and that's not at all what Darcel's story is. So I'm going to let her start talking while we still have a good connection here. And Darcel, give us the background of how you became an artist. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I, I was, uh, I pretty much did art since I was a little girl. My mom, I would say that I would uh, have messy hair and I didn't want to go anywhere or do anything. I just want to make little things all the time. So my parents called me an artist since a child. Um, and I did a lot of different creative things. I would uh, sew things or uh, create things out of cardboard, draw, uh, but, and I would, I did different things. And at, right out of high school, I studied graphic design, but I, I never finished my degree and I decided to get married and have kids. Uh, so I was a stay home mom, but I found any kind of creative thing I could do along the way until um, a tragedy struck my family and uh, both my parents were shot. Uh, my mom, uh, you know, thankfully lived miraculously and made a miraculous recovery. Uh, my dad, not so much. He, he died at the age of 54 and wow, I was 31 and I had this feeling of like, holy cow, life is short. And I, um, I just had this moment of, wow, who am I? You know, what if I only have 23 more years um, in this life? So I started to think a little bit more about who I am and kind of what have I focused on? Um, I had a backhanded compliment from someone one time and said, wow, you're just like my sister. Um, you are a jack of all trades, but a master of none. So I felt really in insulted, like, wow, I really need to master something. So um, I started taking classes uh, in oil painting. Not, and I loved it. It was at a community center, Birmingham Bloomfield Arts Center. And then I uh, decided to go to college for creative studies where I had studied graphic design right out of high school, not right out of high school, but earlier. And um, I signed up for fine art painting. and. Took me three years full time to graduate. I had kids in middle school, and um, it was a hassle. You know, it was it was it was a struggle, but um, I painted. I got real excited about painting uh, Detroit urban landscape, and I pa I painted so many paintings, and everything was going great. And I have a dear friend, um, 
Joan Schwartz, who's one of the MAO instructors. And she said, you need to take a mosaic workshop uh, with me. So I did, I went to Mexico with her and I took a mosaic workshop and that was fine. And then um, I came back and I continued doing my paintings. And then she said, there's more workshops. And I said, I am a painter. And anyway, I went to a few more workshops um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot from uh, Carol Shelton. She, she was formerly a, paint, formerly a painter as well. And Carol um, was able to uh, introduce me to the way uh, the glass related to paint strokes and how the, the glass, you know, you direction it on a face or something, the way that you would run a brush to form, uh, you know, form the shape and um, it all clicked. And so um, I, little by little, just I decided to try to make a really big mosaic of one of my urban landscape paintings. And when I was done, I was so excited about it. I, I decided this is the way to go. So um, that's what I've been doing. Um, but it's, it's amazing how much my painting background really relates to what I do now in mosaic. It's and do you paint at all anymore? No, I have not painted at all, really, in the last few years, nothing. So, so everything that's in your studio behind us that we will, in a little bit, get a tour of is all mosaic <laughs> materials. Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. And if you ever got commissioned to do a painting, would you go back to it? Maybe. Depends on if it was something I really wanted to do. Right. And tell me a little bit more about your background as a trained artist, because many mosaic artists kind of take it on and just learn and they learn in workshops that are a couple days long or they learn from mosaic arts online courses or other courses. But something can really change when you have a proper training in art. So talk a little bit more about when you went back to school, because it was in your 30s. And then you also got a business um, as part. Uh, you know, you learned business as well in this school. Can you like elaborate a little more on that? Yeah, but the business advice was not as glamorous as you think it was. Uh, the very first <laughs> day at, at CCS, College for Creative Studies, um, they broke us up down into departments and the department head from that uh, fine arts gathered everyone in the room and said, hey, is everybody here realize we're here for fine arts? Everybody here knows this is fine arts. Yeah, 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 we're here for fine arts. Okay, I wanna make it really clear there are no jobs in fine arts. Everybody aware of that? Let's move on. So um, everybody knows that it's not it's not easy. Um, but I did notice that the difference between taking classes at like a community college or a, not college, a community center, versus going back to to uh, formal college was that um, the critiques are real honest and cutting and sending home tears a lot. But that's how you grow. So a lot of times um, it was that constructive criticism that. Uh, help me see how to grow and take it to the next step. You know, so many things are broken down into, uh, you, you learn about perspective, you learn about composition, uh, you know, color, and th there's whole classes in those things and art history and things that really build upon, you know, a solid foundation. But having said that, I will say, there are some incredible individuals out there that work so hard uh, without the, you know, the formal training and they do really well. So it takes, yeah. it just takes uh, persistence, whether you're formally trained or you're not. It just uh, making your, making a commitment to art and really um, finding the discipline. Yeah, I, th I couldn't agree more. It's that reporting to work every day and means reporting yeah. to your studio every single day. And some days are gonna be amazing and breakthroughs and some days are gonna be complete slogs. And yeah. I know you and I talked about this when you were here at the studio that, you know, it happens to many artists, but it's pushing through those slogs that you really can have these amazing breakthroughs. And on that note, let's talk more about your subject matter, when it was painting and what it is now, which you are really getting known for, which is the not getting you are known for is this Detroit urban landscape. And I think it's so important. It's one of the really big messages we like to push at Mosaic Arts Online is to really find your creative voice. And I think when people see your work, they know it is you. Yeah, um, you know, when I start, first started going back to school at CCS, I was living in the suburbs and I'd come back to Detroit and then we'd go, you know, we had an hour and a half lunch break every single day. And so I'd take, go with my, my friends and we'd go 
find somewhere to eat for lunch and I'd find myself at like Eastern Market or places that I'd gone with my parents, you know, growing up. And um, I, I think, oh God, that was so cool. I remember this such like a, so sentimental, some of these things. And then I'd go back to the suburbs and I'd hear people just say such rotten things about Detroit. I'm like, well, you know, um, it's, it's not that rotten, you know, I've been there going there and it's, 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 and this was back around 2000. So it wasn't as great then, but suddenly, you know, things are really turning, really turning around here. Detroit's pretty exciting right now. Um, and I'm excited to be part of that growth. But um, so during the time when I, right toward, you know, around the turn of 2000, I was painting a lot about Detroit and uh, just trying to send out a positive message with what my art, with my art. And um, when I started making the first big mosaic of the urban landscape city, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that I had such a profound thought of up ahead of time, this is what I'm gonna do. But it was while I was actually constructing this big mosaic, this, this feeling came across that I had, I was taking all these shattered up pieces of glass and I was rebuilding a city. And um, it just really felt right uh, and, and the glass kind of helped me um, bring a little bit more meaning into what I was doing and, um, and, and kind of illustrate or speak, uh, I, I, I just, just kind of help uh, voice my opinion about how we're rebuilding. And um, I like that. And, and when you look at the painting from a distance, you see, you know, it looks, it looks very much like a painting, you know, the mosaic from a distance. Um, but then when you get up close, you can see all the little cracks and, and the pieces that, you know, the pieces that were been pieced together. And um, that's what I see what's going on here in the city. There's um, a lot of uh, money being invested in the city and all kind of different areas. Thank goodness it's kind of now coming into the neighborhoods and um, different areas. It was originally just in the downtown area, but now it's really growing. And um, it's kind of connecting little areas that, because Detroit is enormous. Um, and you see people trying to preserve some of the iconic structures and that really speaks to me. Well, and I think that your work is gonna be a history book at one point, just because it is showing in such a beautiful medium that is unique with the glass, these buildings. And some of them may not last forever, some may, but it really is something that you can preserve the legacy of Detroit. And before we go on our studio tour, um, let's talk a little bit about you had a one woman show recently or recently feels like, you know, nine Last months. Year, yeah. I know it's like zoom with this past year. And then the Kresge Foundation, talk a little bit about that, what you um, were awarded because you really are um, in the mosaic community and the art community. You have really, um, had some pretty big events happen that I think would be really awesome to talk about. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess it was a year ago. Um, I had a solo exhibition at the Northville Art House. Um, it's a community art center. And um, during the pandemic, it kept, you know, it was very uncertain the whole time whether the show was gonna go on or not go on because of uh, everything was shut down. Um, and as it turned out, uh, they, they put limitations on, um, the amount of people that could come into the gallery at a time. And um, much to my surprise, so many people showed up for the opening. They had to let people in, you know, in groups, little groups at a time. They could stay in a certain amount of time with masks and then, you know, go through. And um, I couldn't believe, you know, the kind of response I got to the work. It was, you know, overwhelmingly positive and, um, Hearing compliments from some of my my mentors was just you know more meaningful than I can express, and yeah. kind of uh, just you know I hear all my friends oh this is so great and everything but when I hear it from my mentors the critical ones um, it really means a lot and on top of that uh, I didn't have much to bring home from that show it was crazy how many <laughs> yeah <people laughs> bought those things. And I, when I originally brought them in there, I thought, I can't just give these things away. They're, t they're so time consuming. It's, I don't know if everybody really realizes how much it costs to make mosaics or how much time actually goes into it. You know, they're, they're 10 hours or 12 hours into a small space. 
um, at the end of a day where I'm just completely, completely dead. So the prices seemed kind of high. And um, when I brought them in there, I thought, well, I don't know if anyone would buy these. And I was much, very surprised. I didn't come well, up with they're and very, so they're very unique. And yeah, I think they're totally worth what, you know, they pay for. We're hearing some noise from the Russell Industrial Center. It's like, a, um, it's an old building and sometimes the heat is kicking on. It's oh, those are the heating noises. Noise. I don't know what that is exactly. I so, love it. Um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about the Kresge Foundation. Well, that was an enormous honor. Um, I had applied several times before. Um, it's, it's a fellowship uh, that is offered every other year to, well, every year they offer it, but one year it's for um, a performance and music artist. And then there's this opposite year is visual and literary. And um, so I've, on the visual years and the literary years, I have applied. So it's an every other year opportunity for a visual artist. And um, they, only, they picked uh, 10 in each category. So 10 visual, 10 literary. Uh, I think about 800 people applied and um, it, it, it brought me to tears to know that I got that award. So, and it brought you to tears, the application process too, right? Yeah, you know what? It took a long time. I, yeah. But it was such a great opportunity to um, mm -hmm. stop because I, I find I'm in this mode of I got to get to the studio. I got to get to the studio. I've got to produce. I got to make mm -hmm. things because I don't want to fall behind. I got to be disciplined. Um, but sometimes I forget the importance of stopping, updating the website and doing the kind of things that I really don't like doing, like going my, updating my resume or my bio and mm -hmm. really, really working through those things. So um, I uh, went up north with my husband for a couple of weeks and he was very helpful um, with his input and, and critiques. And, but I, I just kept writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting um, the different uh, essay questions that they ask. And in doing so, it is almost like making a tally list of all the things you've accomplished. And I turned that application in thinking whether I get it or not, this was such a valuable experience and I felt really good. I kind of was yeah. like say, a, a moment to sit down and reflect about how much I have done. And yes. um, so I felt really great about that. And I did feel like if I had a chance ever, this would be the one. Cause I really felt like I had made a, 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 a you know, sizable stride in my work and the progress. And I was, uh, I, I'm excited about that. And so now with the award, you are able to use that to further your art in, you know, still just in the mosaic and stuff like that, correct? Yeah, um, it's a $25,000 award, which is exciting. Um, and, you know, it, in the arts, I could sell all kind of stuff, but still barely pay for my supplies in my studio right. rent because right. that's just the nature of it. So um, it was awesome for that, um, but it's, it's the honor. It's the honor that's the biggest thing um, and a lot of approval in, in the art community and uh, a heavy thing on my resume, so. Yes, 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 yes. we love it. Do you wanna maybe start to show everyone your studio and give a walking tour? We're gonna go really slow so that the camera can catch up because the bandwidth can get a little funky. So Darcel's gonna show us her table where she works that she made herself, literally, I think every nail she put into it when we yeah. talked about it. And then she'll show us what's on her table, the piece she's working on right now. And then she has a few other works that are also at the studio. So I'll let you kind of take it from here. Okay. And All right, let me turn this camera around here. Yep, there okay. we go. All righty. Um, so I am at the Russell Industrial Center and it's uh, an older complex. So it's kind of gritty and um, dirty a little bit, but it's it's so perfect for making and creating. There's a ton of artists and musicians here. But this is my workspace here. I have a six, five, six foot by six foot table and um, I have storage underneath and everything's on wheels so I can push it around. And um, I other little storage tables on wheels again. Uh, this one is pretty interesting because I can, I created uh, some storage in here for some of my treasures. I find most of this outside on the ground. 
I pick it up. Um, I, I have a dear friend. She's willing to go with me and we uh, pick up all kind of junk or I buy things on Etsy or I will go to antique places and find things. But uh, this table is also a nice little spot for cutting. So I have multiple tables with storage and I also have other kind of treasures that I keep in clear glass jars so I can um, find them when I need them. And uh, so I have anything from old keys, old watch faces to bullet shells or cute little round circles and glass and, and bottle caps, all kind of cool things. So I really enjoy using those. Um, and Anyway, I, I sort the glass into different bins and I have to, that's one of the things, it takes a lot of time because when I'm working, I'll make a giant mess. As you can see here, I actually tidied this up a little bit for today, but I make a giant mess and then I have to kind of put things in bins and then sort and sort and sort. And I take the tiny pieces and sort them into different bins, but it's always important to keep all those little pieces because um, it's like another color of paint. So um, again, another storage table. Here's my vise where I can uh, flatten out some of the steel um, pieces I find that are bent or and I can uh, clamp it in there and kind of straighten it out. Um, you know, paper cutter and all my tools that I use to um, uh, do all kinds of stuff with <laughs> make canvases or, or my wood, wood blocks. Although most of them lately I've been buying but um, uh, this is our little, I have a studio partner, by the way, over here, Mel Rosas. He's a wonderful painter, uh, retired from Wayne State University painting. And um, he's a great studio partner. So um, this is our little, we call that the living room area. And sometimes, you know, we have to sit down and rest, eat our lunch or uh, different things. So um, we are on the bridge. So the Russell Industrial Center is a huge complex and has multiple buildings. And there are some cool areas that actually uh, are like a little bridge connecting different buildings. So in our studio, I'm gonna turn around here, I'll show you, we have windows on, on both sides because we are in the bridge. And um, it's a huge space um, and you know, it's kind of a rundown building which makes it kind of affordable for artists and it's been a wonderful place for me to create. So, um, I'm turning slowly, hopefully turning slowly enough. But you can kind of see outside there, that's uh, what I see through the uh, windows. I see the highway. A lot of my art lately, I've really been fascinated with some of these, uh, they make great mosaics with all the windows. So I really uh, enjoy getting a lot of photo re reference from around here. And this is our kitchen. Um, there's something I painted a while back. Um, above there, but, uh, and there's our doors out to the hallway, but I'll come, I'm coming over here to, um, well, there's some, some of my, some of my work. This is the kind of work I've been, I make. This is, um, um, beautiful rust and it's a big, uh, it's kind of a large piece. I think it's 30 by 40. And on this piece, I, um, while I was making it, I said, I got to the shaded part of those buildings in the background and I realized, oh, I don't have any brown glass. So I clustered a bunch of my rusted objects and it came into some, became something so interesting to me. So I, I ended up, I started using a little more of that stuff. I try to sneak it in here and there, but sometimes I usually try to make it look a little more camouflage. But this one, it really worked. So, um, and this has different glass that uh, had such cool texture to it, it was able to really work for me in the, the rust patterns that I saw in the reference photo. Um, this is a cool piece that, I really like this piece. It's um, John R. Underpass, but I like the way the shadows kind of come across the street. And I use a lot of reflective glass so you kind of see how you, know, you get some movement as you walk past. Um, this is a piece I'm really excited about, it's new. And again, I um, put a lot of those rusted objects. This is a different overpass where a train, it's a train track that goes above there. But 
this was actually a really blurry photo, but it worked so great because a blurry photos kind of enhance how much glare is on the road from the lights. And I enjoy doing that. So that was a fun piece. Um, and I was really happy with my graffiti there. So you can kind of see it has different uh, kind of colors in there. Um, now, then I, I'm invited into a show called Actual Size. So every piece has to be eight and a half by 11, um, but no bigger. Could be a little smaller, but this is a brand new piece I made for that. Uh, and again, this is some a photo reference. Photo reference for this was here at the Russell Industrial Center. I just happened to see that super cool truck out there or camper. Um, just kind of a little abstract. Sometimes I just make these for fun. Then um, one of my very first round mosaic made from one of the industrial molds I bought at an antique place at the Russell Industrial Center. And I wish so badly I could remember the exact name, but Ryan Cunningham was uh, is the guy that owns it and he's wonderful. Um, so I told him I was interested and he collected all the ones he had and I bought them all. So uh, I have a whole round series on the way. And um, this is just a little sunrise piece um, that I made. Um, so now I'm coming back over here. This is our workroom. We've combined our power tools and we have uh, some saws and um, different power tools and we have a utility sink. So this is where we let all the sawdust go. Even though it's pretty dirty and gritty around here, sometimes it's better to keep at least the sawdust in a different area. But um, that area is, you know, we call that the work room. So um, other than that, I mean, that's the whole, the whole place. Um, and uh, I love it here. So. Um, yeah, if you want to go back wherever you want to sit, I have a couple of questions that people might be interested. Okay. Um, where do you, I know the answer, but where do you source your glass from and how important is it to have like large amounts of it for what you do? Well, um, I get most of it at Delphi by glass in, um, Lansing, Michigan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like a little over an hour's drive for me. And, but they have, they have a lot of glass, a big variety. And it, I need that, you know, I can find some glasses at, glass at some places like Hobby Lobby, the quality of glass is not like what right. I find at Delphi. Um, before the pandemic, my husband and I had gone to Chicago and we went to Ed Hoy and that was fabulous. I got a lot of great glass there. So I try to collect what I can. Um, when I go into places like Delphi, they have the scrap bins and I will buy any, pretty much anything that's colorful. Um, I don't, I guess I don't buy the clear or, you know, but I get all the scrap glass I can because when you're doing something um, like what I do, I use so many small pieces and that variety of colors is what really is key in um, making it look like a painting. Well, and I think that's what's important for people to understand is that if you're not familiar with how a painter works, which some people might not be, is they can take two to three tubes of paint and make 20 different colors and different shades. And so I think you're trying to sort of do the same thing with stained glass is your, you know, finding little bits with just a shade darker, shade lighter. And that we all know can happen on one piece of stained glass, which is the beauty of it. Um, but you don't feel committed to having to have a big two by four sheet and that being your mosaic. You really want the smaller variety that really can, you know, sort of work itself in and make it look like it's a paint stroke, like you said, what Carol taught yeah. you. I do get some big pieces because I'll like want maybe a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times I want one consistent color for the background. Um, so I do buy larger sheets that, you know, are pretty large. Uh, but I do, I do like a lot of, a lot sure. of variety with paint. You know, I got very good at making absolutely any color I want. You know, I could yeah. hold my photo reference and make a color and hold it next to the photo. And it was a spot on match. But with glass, you have to choose the next best color. And sometimes if, they, if I don't have anything that's really close, I will find two colors that maybe I would have mixed if they were paint and I'll kind of weave them, you know, like on a ground or something. And it kind of reads as the color that I want it to be. 
So, or sometimes I just pick a different color altogether, just something that's kind of the same color value. So someone, Cheryl's asking, what is the average size of glass sheet that you start with? Oh, I, I would say the average size might be 12 by 12 or 12 by 14. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them, you know, yeah, most of them are that size. And do you grout your mosaics? I do. I, uh, I put, I have relatively tight spaces and on occasion I leave intentional, uh, like say for window panes, I might leave a little gap between the glass because I'm counting on that black grout because I always use black or charcoal that black grout to kind of, you know, fill in there and become those window panes. Right. But um, yeah, I, I grout them. And do you, what are the most uh, common tools that you're using? Are you a cutter person, the nippers? How does it work for you with the tools? And do you grind or sand any of the glass? Well, um, I use cutters and nippers, um, probably equally on that front because I, I make a lot of long strips uh, and then I use the glass cutter and um, long strips, a lot of times I'll just take a long strip and then I break it into little pieces. Uh, it depends on what area I'm doing. So if I'm doing some foliage, I might use my nippers and tip it to kind of get some more curves and then I make a little pile of those. Um, but the long strips work for so many things. You know, if I'm doing a row of windows, I might make a variety of long strips and then make a little pile of a variety of color of windows. Um, but yeah, I do, I equally have both. Now, Grinding and sanding, not too much. I uh, I really like that fresh cut, and so I'll um, make a pile of pieces or a variety, and then I'll choose the next, you know, the one that kind of fits the best. But you're know, not that I haven't ground or, but I try not to do too much. Right, and yeah, you sand it a couple, mostly just so you didn't cut yourself, you know, if it really does get that really yeah. sharp edge. But shape-wise, you're not trying to shape, change the shape with any grinding or anything no, like that. No, no, Yeah, and um, someone's asking, how do you achieve those buses and cars to look like a painting when we know it's glass? And I don't know if you can answer that in one, two sentences. Well, take class. No, um, yes, that's where I was going to go. <laughs> a car or a bus is actually a box. It's a box. So um, start with a box and you use some perspective yep. and you use some color. You know, you got to look at your shaded side and your and your lit side and um, pay attention to those things. And, and you never mix up. You never accidentally put some of the, the, the color that's lit by the sun on the shaded side or right. that'll just kill it for you so you have to you know be decisive this side is only the lit side this side is the shaded side so that really is key but um perspective helps a lot and everything is a box so and on that note uh when darcel and i were first talking about her teaching a course at um mao you know, she is known for these urban landscapes, but I felt that, you know, for right now, the um, members of our community may enjoy starting with something a little bit more simple that still teaches the two point perspective, which if you don't even know what that is, it's a really important thing to learn if you want to achieve something um, in the line of what, you know, Darcel does with your own creative voice, but also it teaches about vanishing points and horizon lines. And those are all sort of like the underbelly of how this look and way is achieved. And so I don't have a shared screen. So I just thought I'd put this up. If you haven't seen this picture yet, this is what she created in the course and what you will see her make from beginning to end. And you can see how the house, the way it is shot, it shows you off to the left, um, the house going back. And that's really important because that is what um, she achieves in the bigger urban landscapes, but we wanted to simplify it because if you can learn the techniques and the methods that are really important, then you can take on a box that can be a car or a bus. And what she's saying about choosing the glass that where the sun is hitting it versus the shaded side, how important that is. And this course, I think really breaks that down for you. Um, to you know really a practice method and we do include this uh image of this house in the course in case you want to follow along exactly 
with her and then you can take it to the next level with your own image or she'll teach you how to pick the proper image and what angles do work. So I think if anyone has any other questions about the course and this method, then I think now's a good time to start to ask them. And Jerry just put his finger up. So let me find out what the question is. Hang on one second. What's your substrates? Oh, so people are interested in what your substrates are. Okay. Um, I'm going to grab one. Go, go for it. Yeah. So uh, Darcel works on lots of different sizes, which you all know can be really important. But here's one that's similar to what will be in the course. So um, I, I, the nearest store for me is Dick Blick, which I love. Um, and they sell these wood, uh, they call them wood panels. I, I call them a canvas sometimes just because I'm used to seeing canvas, but it is pretty much a wood canvas. But it's, uh, you know, a nice smooth surface and it has built up in the back. So this one is, um, you know, an inch and a half wide. Some of them are three quarters of an inch. I think they come a little wider too on some of the bigger ones. But um, I love these because they're smooth and um, it's, the glass, you know, lays really flat on there. And I, it's, it's just, it's a great surface for me. So they're, and they're not very expensive. These things are, uh, you know, pretty reasonable. Anyway, I'm not trying to make a dick flick advertisement, but I really do like this. People can make, their, people make their own panels like that. And there are times I just work on a piece of uh, plywood and um, put a hanger on the back. So it depends on what you like. Someone's asking, how do you approach your skies and other backgrounds? Um, you know, uh, the skies, I have, uh, do you want me to bring my camera around and show? Okay. Oh yeah. If you want to show or bring one of the pieces to okay. you, if you want to okay. pick one of them up. Okay. And then you can I'm sort of get show it. Okay. Um, so you teach yeah, show them. Got, wow. These don't have much sky. This one has sky. I just am noticing that. But on this here, um, this, I use just one color, but I, um, for some reason, I, I was looking for a tile for my home one time and I saw this pattern where it had the wave and then little, you know, uh, little cuts. And so I, I just started that. So I just take the next piece of glass and I find that it's just fun. It's just fun and it's something I, I kind of was inspired by some home tile. So sometimes I layered. Now this this piece here has, um, you know, I was trying to get the the variety of layers of clouds and, and sunrise coming up here. So this one, I kind of did that thing I was talking about where I kind of weave colors back and forth to kind of create the color I want. And, uh, you know, with the play, the, the playfulness of like how it changes as you kind of, you move back and forth is uh, exciting to me. Oh, here's another one that had a little sky in it, but and this one has a, you know, that finish on there that I love. But again, the waves. And I find that by cutting it and try, not trying to make one piece, I can um, get around areas like this and still you know, maintain that flow of the curves and the, the, you know, the softness of the sky. And while, while those stuff, you're still showing your work, talk a little bit about your adhesive and how your pieces are all interior and, um, what what works for you well you know um i work directly on the raw wood surface it's and i used uh lately i've been using mostly tacky glue um, and i also use weld bond those are two that work really well for me and i don't find uh, i need to prime them or do anything because if i have a piece in the wrong spot it's very difficult to get it off and it's very likely i'm going to take a little of the wood with me because it's it really holds I usually have to wet it down, but uh, it stays. And does the um, does the piece come off with the water and brush if it's this tacky glue, just like it does with Weld Bond? Yep, it, it looks a lot like Elmer's glue, but uh, it seems to hold a whole lot, um, whole lot better. So, do you ever use Thin Set for any of your pieces, or Wetty Board, or any of the outdoor uh, substrates? I have not yet, um, but I the only maybe. Um, Wetty board I've used is the ones that come in the um, easy frame, those little miniature frames. The metal, those are really sweet. You know, they have a little metal frame, and then the wetty weedy board. I don't know is 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 in there already. And right. 
Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about the easy frames we love. Yeah. From Wind. Yes. Those are yeah. amazing. And yeah, once that substrate's in there, there's no reason to change it to wood. Just use yeah. whatever that is and go straight to it. And can you go over a little bit? I don't know how you can explain it, but maybe talk about the different sizes of your Tessera, you know, tiny to bigger okay. and maybe on your work table with the mini yeah. the bus. Um, talk about, yeah, what's on your table right now. Okay. Um, this is a per piece that's underway. Um, and I had a lot of fun with those cones. And uh, pieces get pretty small. Now, I'll show you, give you an idea how small they get. So some of these pieces are rather small. And, um, but I like, I like the being able to try to create that, you know, that volume and, um, some pieces are super tiny and I just squeeze them in there. And um, so this is what my table looks like. Might look like a mess, but I might find a piece like this and it's super valuable <laughs> and it's just the right one. So um, I leave them kind of, I don't sweep it up all, all, you know, all the time. As I'm working, I leave little pieces around and I get used to knowing where like all the little pieces of extra dichroic I put off to a little corner or just, you know, everybody has their own method, but this is, the pieces are rather small. And um, again, I use a lot of, you know, strips. I cut strips and then from the strips, I might, you know, cut uh, little squares or, you know, try to get the curve in there somewhere. But this is what I pretty much, you know, these are the nippers I use, my running pliers. So, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I have little bins with different glasses, and those are some dichroic. So, I am sure many people's studio tables look similar to yours. Yeah. There's no way to be organized in no. the process, and it, I think it helps. It's like again, it's. Do you ever see an artist's paint palette look clean? Then it's not a good sign. <laughs> it should be messy. It should yeah. have lines mixed up. Um, I am sure many of you are looking at Darcel's pieces going, how does she do that? Because it really is quite phenomenal the way she does pick her glass to create the highlights and the shading and the perspective. But all of that is very achievable. And like I said, we really wanted to break it down to something that you would feel if you took her course and you learned her techniques that you would feel gratified and not frustrated. So we did not want to throw you into the deep end with this course. But if anyone else has any questions, throw them in the chat. But in the meantime, I am going to offer up the very generous bonus gift, which is 15% off Darcel's new course, which is live now. And you actually get it for the 15% off until midnight tomorrow night and perspective in mosaic art with Darcel. And Jerry will put this in the chat and in the comments that um, this code is good until, like I said, tomorrow night. Remember, we have payment plans as well. So you can do four payment plans or you can do the full purchase price. And then if you do miss this code, it will be 10% off like our regular launch prices until Sunday next week, a week from tomorrow. So you have the extra special gift of 15%, 5% more now until Sunday, tomorrow at midnight, or then it'll be 10% off till the next Sunday. So this was just such a special event. Do we have any more questions? Um, there's a question about, um, do you work from photos? And how do, you, how do you decide which one makes it into a mosaic? Do you work from photos? And if how do you decide which one makes it into a mosaic? That's a good question. I definitely work from photos. I uh, take the photos myself um, and it's color and composition uh, that pretty much determine which photo I'm going to use. It's not necessarily the ones that, a lot of the best photos are the ones that are a little bit blurry for me because um, I really uh, like to kind of interpret things a little bit um, uh, more, uh, I can't think of the word. In, um, you just interpret them. <laughs> yeah, impress impressionistic. impressionistic. And I, yes, yeah, yes. That's the word I'm, and um, yeah. so, but I also uh, like how when you, uh, there's a little glare, uh, it really enhances the glare and uh, stretches it. So I, I like that. 
Well, and I think it's important too that you share in the course how the different views people have of the finished mosaic can really change their perception of the whole work, how it's late at night, but maybe the ground was wet and how you use glass yeah. to create the reflectivity. But then if you see it from another side, it may not be reflective. So yeah. the glass is very much, you know, kind of your, it is your paint and it is how yeah. you manipulate the visual that you're trying to um, achieve. And you are so incredibly talented and we cannot thank you enough for, you know, sharing this time with us and coming out here to Santa Barbara to shoot the course. And I do see possibly, you know, a 2.0 and going a little bit deeper into the maybe some kind of urban landscapes and teaching about boxes that become cars and buses. <laughs> and, um, but I think what people can achieve and learn from this course can really take them far. And there is so much um, information that before you even start to pick your glass, of how you get your image to the substrate is really different than how um, many people have been doing it and have been taught. And learning those techniques can really take you um, a lot farther. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you agree. And then, you know, there's, yes. And there are other courses at Mosaic Arts Online that are great to build on this too, with color theory, composition. So we're really trying to, you know, take, you know, some art elements to another level that can make it more interesting and expanding for, you know, what I said in the very beginning, that your art background is not just a hobby. It was something that you took very seriously, educated yourself on. And whether you went to school or not, what you said about the studio uh, time and really putting the time in every day is where um, the lessons are learned and the work gets done. Yeah. And I, if I could add that, um, I think that, you know, a lot of people that maybe um, are interested in taking mosaic classes are uh, people who already do mosaics, but I feel like there's a whole new world out there for people who are painters um, that don't really realize they can apply those same painting skills in glass and um, and probably be pretty successful at it. Uh, that's what Carol Shelton taught me. But no, <laughs> and I'm you know, kidding aside, I really uh, feel like that's a pretty important thing. And I also think another, you know, thing I want to mention about the class is that, um, you know, we just, there's one point perspective, two point perspective, three point perspective, all kinds of different things. And um, for this, we just chose two point perspective because we're doing one building and you can't really do one, one building with a one point perspective. It's, well, maybe there's a way, but um, for our purposes, the two point perspective is the one that worked the best. And I tried to just streamline and make it as simple as possible to understand um, and there's there's a lot more. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more I could say about perspective, but I tried to keep it just really simple and streamlined so that uh, everybody could catch on and not feel frustrated. So. Yes, yes. I think if anyone's looking to create perspective, and I remember back when I did a commission in 2012 that was a building, and how important it was to understand these methods, to give it the depth and to give it dimension, the highlighting and the shading, where the light comes from. They're all really important. But once you learn them, like for you, it just becomes second nature. And so it's just exercising a new muscle and figuring out how to um, create things like this. And we hope that this course really is a good foundational one that can build on itself. And like you said, there is three point perspective. There is ways to learn taller buildings and um, things like that. But I think this is a great, great beginning. So just make sure you guys use this code if you're gonna go for it now or by tomorrow night. And we will send out an email for those that missed that with the new code. And again, I cannot thank you enough for taking this time to be with us here at our live events and this course and just your creative spirit. It's really, really a special um, style of mosaic art that you've taken on. We thank Joan Schwartz and Carol Shelkin very much for pushing you in the direction they did. And yes, I hope there's other painters out there that might see this as another, just you know, an additional medium to, to add to their art as well. Yeah, and thank um, you. And thank you, Joan and Carol, because uh, yes. inspire me more than you realize. And, uh, Tammy, this has been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys. We'll see you again on the next one. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
she left, but I'll call her back right now. That was awesome.